I would like to welcome all of you to Texas Christian Church. Uh, we're a little different than a lot of the churches that we go to with Area Men's Fellowship. This last weekend, we all turned our clocks back an hour for daylight savings time. When you walk in these doors, you kind of turn your clocks back about 50 years, or maybe 75. Uh, it's just your old country church, and yet the Lord has done tremendous things. And we're honored to be able to have you fellows here tonight and continue this great legacy uh, of Airy Men's Fellowship. Before uh, Bob comes to speak to us, he asked if I would read a passage of Scripture. Uh, tonight's taken out of the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in, in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. It is a tremendous honor tonight to introduce our speaker. Uh, we often talk of people who need no introduction, and if anyone fits that bill, it would be Bob Phillips. I'm sure you are all not only familiar with him, but have been blessed by him and his ministry throughout the years. He has been a tremendous blessing to this church and to this church's preacher. And I appreciate him a great deal on a personal level, as well as for our church. What he has done for the camp has been well documented. Uh, and as the Lord is opening a new chapter in his life, a chapter called retirement, uh, I am excited uh, to have Bob come and open the word and share with us. Would you please warmly welcome Bob Phillips. Thank you very much, Scott. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the invitation to uh, share with you tonight. Uh, Scott suggested that uh, possibly I just kind of go down through memory's lane of some almost 70 years of ministry and share some motivation and inspiration highlights that, uh, that I've experienced. So I'm going to do that, package it around uh, this conversion story that um, uh, Scott read for us from the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. I heard about this couple that went to a pet store, and just after they went through the front door, a parrot in a cage said, hey, buddy, you know what? Well, the guy said, no, what? He said, you're fat and your wife, wife is ugly. And the guy thought, well, that's kind of, kind of rude. 
and he looked around a little bit and uh, came back near the, the uh, uh, cage and the parrot said, hey buddy, you know what? And the guy said, no, what? You're fat and your wife's ugly. Well, he thought, that's terrible. This happened two or three times. And so finally the guy went back to the owner of the store and said, uh, I need to tell you that parrot you've got up in the, near the front uh, door uh, just insulted me and my wife. He did? Well, what are you talking about? He said, well, three or four times he told me I was ugly and my wife, or my, I was fat and my wife was ugly. He, that parrot told you that? Yes, three or four times. Well, he, the owner went up to the front, pulled the cage door open, grabbed the uh, parrot by the ankles, by the feet, and uh, shook him up and down and said, what did you say to that man? I told him he was fat and his wife was ugly. You did? And he biffed him around, feathers were flying everywhere, and he said, don't you say that anymore, don't you say that anymore. Okay, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. And so finally he said, you won't do what? I won't tell him he's uh, fat and his wife is ugly. I won't say it again. So he threw him back in the cage. The couple looked around a little bit more and um, got ready to leave just to reach for the door handle. The parrot said, hey, buddy. He turned around and said, uh, no. He said, you know what? He turned around and said, uh, no, what? You know what? You know what? You know <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this guy was invited to uh, speak at a church, and uh, after the service was over, as was the custom, went to the back door uh, to shake hands with people, and as he was doing so, a fellow came out and said, that was a terrible sermon. And he thought, well, that's kind of rude, kind of abrupt, and the guy circled around, got in the line again, came by and said, that was the worst sermon I have ever heard. And he thought, wow. Well, he circled around, came the third time, and said, I hope you never come back here again. That was terrible. And uh, the janitor was busy kind of picking papers up and so forth and had observed all this. And so he thought he ought to cue the visiting minister in a little bit. So he went and said, I, I we need to tell you about him. He's, he's a very fine man. He means well, but he's just mentally uh, short-circuited, and all he does is just go around repeating all the time what other people are saying. <laughs> <clears throat> Somebody asked uh, what I was going to do after I retired, and that's coming at the end of the year, I hope I'll get a chance to preach. I want to preach as often as I can. I love to preach. And so if your preacher is sick or is on vacation and um, Rob or Kevin or Max are not available, then call me and I'd be glad to come and, and fill in. Let them come first and keep you abreast with what's going on at the camp. That's very, very, very important. Uh, the guy was told one guy, that he was getting ready to retire. And he said, well, what are you going to do the first year after you retired? And he said, I'm going to get my rocking chair and put it on the front porch and sit in it. He said, what are you going to do the second year? I'm going to start rocking. <laughs> so, so. Well, I want to share with you tonight just a few things. And I, I'm going to share several personal things, several things that I've observed several things that have happened in my presence, in, in my ministry, and um, some 70 years of motivation and inspiration. And while I give several personal things or observations, I do not mean at all to omit the fact that my chief motivation, and I trust yours too, whatever you do and say, is motivated because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Also, the example of one like the Apostle Paul, who one day was killing Christians, and the next day he was one. And the example that uh, Paul left for us as one who responded to the opportunities of service. And the first thing I want to say, I have been motivated and inspired by those who have responded to opportunities to serve. 
opportunities to serve. The um, Philip is first mentioned back in the uh, sixth chapter of the book of Acts. You may remember the church is really quite new. However, it's growing uh, rapidly. There were thousands now who had embraced the faith and the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, soon there was a murmuring. Can you imagine this? Early in the days of the church, there was a murmuring in the church, criticizing because uh, some were saying that the Grecian widows were being neglected and the Jewish widows were being shown favoritism. And apparently, apparently that accusation was accurate because the apostles called the brethren together and said, select from your midst uh, seven men who are full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and who have a good reputation. And I'll tell you, men, when you find in the church men who have good reputation, who are full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom, good things are going to happen. And among those that were selected was, was this man, Philip, and also Stephen, who's, uh, who was the first, as far as we know, the first Christian martyr, stoned to death. Can you imagine that? Crucifixion is one of the worst kinds of physical death. But I think stoning must surely be the second. Can you imagine any one of you going out in the parking lot and the rest of us getting stones the size of a baseball or a softball and us, us lining up and stoning you until you took your last breath? Well, Stephen was one of those selected to take care of the neglected widows, as was Philip. Well, soon the persecution was severe, and the scripture tells us the disciples were spread abroad, and as they went, they went what? They went preaching. They went sharing the good news. That shouldn't, this shouldn't surprise us. That's exactly what Jesus asked every disciple to do. And Philip was down in the, went down to the region of Samaria, was having great response to his preaching. The angel of the Lord directed him to go to this road from Gaza down to Jerusalem, and he went, and when he got there, he found a single guy, as far as we know, riding in a chariot, reading the scripture. Philip was available for service. Philip responded, and as a matter of fact, if you go back and read, it says that Philip ran. Seems to indicate that he was ready and anxious, ran to join himself with this uh, man riding in the chariot. My life has been richly blessed, and I have found much motivation by those who respond to opportunities to service, who are available to do whatever the Lord puts before them uh, to do. Some have been strong Bible teachers, Small classes, small groups in a home, sometimes large classes, but they've been Bible students. And it's been an inspiration and a motivation to me to see men teach the Bible. And others have been men who have responded to other kinds of gifts. And um, really in the scripture, it doesn't uh, quantify or the, the, the gifts in terms this is important and this is less important so much. For example, in Romans, the sixth cha 12th chapter, beginning with verse 6, or 4, excuse me, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And since we have gifts that differ, According to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service, the gift of service, if service in his serving, or he who teaches to his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality. Did you realize there was a gift of giving? Those who are blessed, my life has been richly blessed by men and women who have the gift of giving liberally. We, um, you probably know back when we first started the dining hall project, we had a Christian man in his business. He and his wife gave the camp two, two cranes. 
two huge construction cranes. They didn't come to the camp. He was in the process of turning his business over to his son. Uh, we simply received the uh, titles to these cranes and endorsed them and turned them over to the son, and the son gave us $563,000 for those. What a blessing. What a motivation. What a challenge for what little I have to see somebody like that who responded with the gift of giving. And others have likewise blessed us. Uh, sometimes it's large gifts like that. Sometimes it's 10000 15000 Sometimes it's $10. Every month we get a letter from a little old lady in Lincoln who is um, obviously on fixed income, $10 every month. And in proportion, that might be more than the person who sends 15000 but to each according to what he has been given. But be sure of this, God will hold us account for all that we have, whether little or much. Um, a few weeks ago, we received this note uh, from a little camper. My name is, and I'll withhold the name, and me and my brother have been going to Little Galilee the past couple of years, and we had a blast. We had a lemonade stand. We had a lemonade stand with a few friends, and we raised around $75 for Little Galilee, but we forgot to give it when we were there. So we are kindly sending it now. You can use it for wherever you need. We're excited to eat. We will be excited to eat in the new dining hall next summer. Little girl wrote that. Lemonade stand. Here's $75. Fellas, if, 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 that, doesn't, if that doesn't start your fire, your wood's wet. Uh, things like that just, things like that happen all the time. And it's, it's been a motivation and a blessing to me to see those who are gifted in giving, those who exercise that gift of liberality. There's a strange verse, at least it seems kind of strange, in 2 Corinthians, the eighth chapter and the fourth verse. Christians elsewhere were taking off up offerings for the brethren back in Jerusalem because they were under hard times, persecution and famine. And uh, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth to encourage them to get ready their offering. And he said, um, follow the example of the Macedonians. And Macedonia had gone through some civil wars and they were having all kinds of difficulty. But in that passage, Paul says, the Macedonians are begging us for the privilege of participation. They didn't want to miss out on the joy. They didn't want to miss out on the fun of sharing what little they had with those who had need. Um, last year, we received over $40,000 from farmers who gave their grain to Little Galilee. We never saw the grain. They made arrangements at the elevator, didn't want it to go through their account, X number of, X number of bushels calculate its worth and send that amount directly to the camp, thus a tax savings for them. People who understand the joy of giving and time and time again we have been blessed in that way among other ways as well. I was attempting to uh, thank uh, a certain man who was, um, had done a great deal for the camp, working and, and um, uh, gifts as well. And uh, I just thanked him. He said, oh, don't thank me. Let me thank you for allowing me the privilege of helping. Isn't that a joy? My life has been enriched and blessed by comments like that and by demonstrations like that. Oh, I, I just kind of feel like most of us need to get a new concept of what it is to be owned by the Lord and to, to give liberally. Some are gifted to do that. And also, you noticed as I read there from Romans, the 12th uh, chapter, the gift of service. Some have the gift of service. And it's been my joy again, and I've been blessed so many times to, to witness those who have the gift of service. And they're available, as was Philip, to respond to opportunities. I'm not going to mention any names tonight. But uh, I will mention abbreviation KP. 
for 40 years, this man has been working sacrificially at Little Galilee. Back in 2001, we, uh, the executive board made, made arrangements for John Turney to work part-time, about half-time. And this is really before we started in the major part of our, our construction programs. Uh, I think we were involved with the uh, activity center at that time. And uh, the view was that, that John would come on full-time sooner or later, hopefully sooner. But uh, John decided uh, after some time that he really wanted to farm and um, perhaps start a trucking business. He had gone to school to learn how to be a, a mechanic on diesel equipment. And so John, John left us. And um, nobody was replaced with John. And so from that day until this very moment, Kevin has assumed all that responsibility with nonstop construction since that time, the last 15 years. And Kevin, I want you to know publicly that you've been a source of motivation and inspiration to me and a lot of other people. And who would I, who, what am I to say? Well, I don't want to work another hour or two or do this or that because it's uh, there are other things I would want to do. I've been blessed to witness people who have the gift of service. And uh, I'm not going to mention again names, but I just want to read for you a few of the things. You say, well, how, how has it been able, how, is it, how could it happen then that uh, Kevin assumed all that responsibility and all the buildings that's gone on plus the maintenance of the other buildings and all that's involved in that? Well, here's another observation and resulting motivation. Just let me mention a few things that happen. Nurses who come and serve, some of them taking vacation time. Horse camp, bringing horses, feed, trailers for transportation, sleeping accommodations, stay all week to work with the, with the campers. Teachers and family group leaders, blessed to be a blessing. Helpers with the zip line, giant swing, high ropes at no charge. 65 years of, of this group with hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been given toward Little Galilee. Construction workers, volunteers around the ground, splitting, uh, splitting wood, painting, cleaning kitchen stoves, mowing, repairing equipment, trimming trees, putting much mulch on the trails, uh, bulldozing, electrical work, wiring for PA system in the new dining hall, installation of equipment in the new dining hall, freezer, and cooler rooms, which I understand we're working today. Construction equipment and operators provided no charge. Hanging of doors, construction equipment left here for us to use as needed. Volunteers for camper registrations, volunteers in the office, those blessed to be a blessing. I have been motivated, and I know many of you have as well, because of this. And that's only a partial list. I just hurriedly wrote down uh, those that I could think of. Several years ago, while ministering at the Eastview Church in Bloomington, we had a young couple with uh, three small boys, and uh, they, uh, they were going through some struggles, having a same challenge a lot of us do, and that is making a distinction between their wants and their needs. And they wanted a lot of things. So he was working two jobs. She was working a, a full job. They were neglecting each other, neglecting the children. And sooner or later, as could be predicted, their, their marriage was on the rocks. They came to me for counseling, and uh, I soon saw it was beyond my abilities. I referred them to some professional counseling. Long story short, they ended up getting a divorce. And you can imagine, in the halls of the church building, pss, 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 have you heard? Isn't it terrible? You could be predicted. It. Everybody could see it was coming, and all that kind of chit-chat going on, and the phone lines were busy. An elder came to me, and he said, Bob, suppose it would be all right if I went to talk to them? I said, I'm sure it would be all right. And he asked me a few questions. I shared with him as much as I could, short of breaking confidence. And uh, he went. It's been some, maybe two or three months later. My phone rang one Friday evening. And um, he said, Bob, is the, uh, are you busy in the morning about 10 o'clock? I said, no. He says, is the chapel busy tomorrow morning about 10 o'clock? And I said, I don't believe so. 
Hey, so I'd like to, for, you to, for you to meet out at the chapel tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We're going to have a wedding service. And while other people were talking about these folk, this godly elder went to talk to them and literally loved them back together. And I say, oh, God, give us more godly elders who are real shepherds, who are really open to responding to opportunities to serve. Whatever the nature of that opportunity might be. Um, I had a lady in the church in Champaign <clears throat> that one, one uh, Christmas found out that there were 120 residents in the Christian nursing home at Lincoln. And she wanted to make sure that uh, all of them had a Christmas gift. And so she, wrote, she crocheted 120 pair of little booties to send over to the Christian nursing home at Lincoln so every resident would have a Christmas gift. <clears throat> Joanne and I have uh, <clears throat> four or five of these Afghans around, uh, around our house. There are a lot of ladies around uh, Champaign-Urbana that uh, have those. Uh, she made them and gave them to the, uh, when they had a baby. They were blessed. This woman responded to the opportunities to serve. That was her gift. <clears throat> oh, I, did I mention that this lady was blind? And when I tried to minister to people like that, I was motivated, inspired, and convicted to say, if they could do that, Phillips, what, what can you do? And I might challenge you this evening. What can you do? Praise God for those who have the gift of service and are available to help in whatever way. Well, I must hasten on. The second blessing I see is by, by seeing the power of the gospel at work. This man was a religious man. He'd been all the way up to Jerusalem to worship. On his way home, reading the scripture, he was a man of, in whom others could have trust and confidence. He was the keeper of the queen's treasury, a religious man, but he was a man who needed to hear the good news. He was reading the prophet Isaiah, beautiful prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus, didn't understand it. He inquired of Philip, who's, a, who's the prophet talking about himself or of somebody else? And Philip began at that same scripture, the scripture says, and preached unto him Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes back to the Father except by me. And here was a religious man, but fellas, the world is filled with religious people, but a lot of them have no relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's been a joy and a privilege to see that happen time and again. Let me share with you just quickly about the horse camp. <clears throat> Early on, we had several people come bring in their horses. Among them was a, a lady from up north of Peoria, brought her horse, and uh, her husband started coming with her just to help take care of the horses and do the grunt work around as the, and help take care of the rest of the horse. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't doing any teaching because you can't share what you don't have. And he didn't have Jesus, so he couldn't teach, he couldn't share, but he was doing what he could do. Came repeatedly, and finally one year, Louis stepped out into the pool and was baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. The joy of seeing the gospel at work. What joy that is. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek as well. Corinth was a wicked city, but Paul writes and said, I came to you, among you, knowing nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Thirdly, <clears throat> the, the joy and the motivation, inspiration of seeing people find that joy in Christ. 
the story concludes by Philip being taken away to preach in other, other, uh, 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 other places, but it says that the eunuch, the one who was baptized, went on his way, what? Rejoicing. And why wouldn't he rejoice? There's always joy and rejoicing whenever one does the will of the Father. Amen? There's always joy and a feeling of goodness that comes to our hearts when we've made ourselves available to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that may be, whether it's been to <clears throat> excuse me, exercise the gift of giving or the gift of service or some other gift. I want to close <clears throat> with this story. Early in the days of Lincoln Bible Institute, when the college was just getting started, the... Um, they sponsored a, a youth rally. Any of you fellows remember going to Lincoln to the youth rallies when the uh, churches, uh, kids, kids would come from churches all over the tri-state area. And Bill Floats had a big parade through the community. And then the rest of the day was spent with uh, boys preaching 10 or 12 minute sermons and competition youth choirs, et cetera. It was a great occasion. Hundreds of kids came. It was an opportunity to recruit for the kingdom. And uh, <clears throat> I graduated in 1954. And the next spring, Joanne and I moved to a ministry in Meadville, Pennsylvania. And I thought, I, I would really like to get a bunch of kids and go back to the youth rally next summer. So I heard about a man who owned a fleet of school buses I wanted to go and see if I could rent a school bus and bring a bus loads of kids back to Lincoln. Found out that I went to his house, found out he wasn't there. He was out at the fairgrounds taking care of his prize horse, and he had a horse that won all kinds of blue ribbons all over. He was an entrepreneur type guy, owned a skating rink, owned a fleet of some 20 some school buses and leased them out to the school system. But on the weekends, he'd take those buses and run all over the county and pick up kids and adults as well and bring them into his into his uh, uh, skating rink so I went out to the <clears throat> went out to the barn and as I approached the barn I, I had a I had a pony and a horse and I grew up but I never heard ponies or horses with names that I heard this guy giving that horse I mean swearing I heard words I had never heard in my life well <clears throat> and after, once I introduced him myself to him, it made no difference that I was a minister. Long story short, out of my growing up on a farm and having a horse, we had some things in common. Long story short, God opened the doors and I was able to lead that man and his wife and their only daughter to the Lord. Did the, I did the wedding for the daughter in the skating rink. Everybody was on school, roller skates. <laughs> she had met her Fiance on the skating rink. Everybody was on school on roller skates, except the preacher. <laughs> <clears throat> but not long after that, all this took place. Elwood came to my office one day and said, "Bob, for 55 years, I have lived for Elwood Holt. I've been able to make money. I've got a good business." beautiful house. He said, for 55 years, I have lived for Elwood Holt. I want to go to Bible college and prepare to be a preacher and spent the rest of my years preaching the good news. He sold his skating rink, sold his buses, sold his house, moved down to Roanoke Bible College and went to school. And... Um, spent the rest of his days preaching the gospel. I have a, um, a bulletin here that he sent to me. It's dated July the 29th, 1962. He's still at Roanoke Bible College, but he's preaching every opportunity he gets. And here's a note in the, um, the bulletin. Words cannot express our thanks to Brother Holt for his working with us the past 10 weeks. As life goes on, we'll never forget the challenge he made to us to live daily for Christ. Our prayer is God will bless him and his, use his talents wherever he labors for the Lord. 
next paragraph, Brother David English was baptized into Christ after the service last Lord's Day. Also, his wife Doris moved her membership. May God richly bless them. And on the back of this bulletin, he writes me a personal note. Dear Brother Bob, this weekend finished my services at Gretna, Virginia, and I thank God for those that came to Christ under my preaching and teaching, and I humbly give God all the credit. I preached in Jarvisburg, North Carolina this past Sunday night, and a lady gave her heart to Jesus. It's wonderful, Bob, to be serving God in this way. I pray that God will continue to use me in his service. Motivation and inspiration by seeing others find the real joy in service in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a blessing it's been to my life to see men like this say at the age of 55, I have lived my life for myself. But from this day on, it's going to be for the Lord. And that's caused me from time to time say, as I think about that blind lady making all those booties and these Afghans, Phillips, what could you do? As I've seen those who give themselves unselfishly in the avenue of service, what can you do? As I've seen men like this make life-changing decisions at that age, what can you do better for the Lord? And I close then with this passage of Scripture. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Thank you, guys. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob, in sharing those who have been an inspiration and a motivation to you. Uh, how many of us can say Bob Phillips has been an inspiration and a motivation to us? Amen? Amen. As we close tonight, I'd like to invite one more person to come and give the closing prayer. I normally don't do this and put somebody on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway, because he's been an inspiration and a motivation to me and I'd like to ask Larry Larson if you'd come and close tonight in prayer and Bob, thank you for all you what you've done for me let's, let's bow in prayer Our Heavenly Father we thank you for this time to gather together in fellowship as friends and as brothers in Christ. We thank you for this church opening up its doors to welcome us in for the great meal we had and the great time we spent together. You've seen us all here safely, and I pray that you'll see us all home safely. And as Bob said tonight, may we continue to serve you using the gifts that you've given us to bring honor and glory to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a safe trip home. Thank you, God.